I am going to uh, put it in a higher gear. I will not detain you. Well, I won't promise. <laughs> Ed Barb, I'm glad y'all are safe and back with us. We know you got to leave us again, but we'll be waiting for you to come back. To really appreciate the good news of the gospel, and I, I think I talk about this every time I preach, and because it's, it's, I, I believe it's very important, you can't appreciate the gospel unless you understand why we have a gospel and why we need a gospel, because uh, sin is the reason that we have a gospel. If you look at uh, Paul's writings, you can see that he, in his writings, that he visited every church, and he, and he verbally gave the gospel to every church, except for one church. And the one church he, he didn't get to visit early on was uh, the Roman church. So when he wrote his gospel to the Romans, he had to give a complete gospel. He didn't want to leave anything out. And how Paul started the book of Romans is how I, 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 I see him wanting to teach us why we have a gospel. Because he starts out with sin. If you, if, and, and if you look at the, if you read uh, Romans chapter 1, you can see that the the uh, what he, he what he's trying to get across what he's trying to get what he's trying what Paul is trying to do and what he tries to do in most of his epistles is he tries to instill our confidence in God and he wants us to not have confidence in ourselves because if we have confidence in ourselves I mean look at look at the world today it, it, according to the way I look at Scripture and, and read the Spirit of Prophecy, the world is 6,000 years old, plus or minus a few years. There has never been a perfect society. There's, never, there's not even a pocket of perfection anywhere. Human beings have been trying to run this world without God. And God has been invited to step aside. We don't need you, God, is what we're saying. And if you look at Romans chapter 1, actually, I don't want to go to Romans chapter 1 right now. I'm trying to think how I can slow this, slow this sermon down just a little bit. Let's go to, to oh, what was that, John? I said you don't have to. This is God today. Amen. Thank you, John. Let's start. Let's go to John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees here. And the desires of your father you want to do. He is a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. Was, late? Was Satan always as this verse appears? Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28. And I'm going to read verses 14 and 15. You are the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You are on the holy mountain of God. You walk back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You are perfect in your ways from the day you were created. Perfect. Till iniquity was found in you. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. Verses 12 
12 through 14. How are you, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. In verse 13 it says, You have said in your heart. Lucifer said in his heart. So only... Only God can see into your heart. And only you can see into your heart. Only two people can see into your heart. Yourself and God. So God saw it. Luc Lucifer did not um, allow even the angels that he... Um, that he... Uh, what's that word? What's that? Deceived. Uh, yeah, he deceived. Thank you very much. I need a little help in the words today. Even the angels he deceived didn't know what was in his heart. It is said that, that, uh, that the angels did not understand Satan until the cross. Because when they saw what the sin had led to, the murder of God, and that's what it was, the murder of God, they didn't understand the problem until then. And then the angels that were sitting on the fence, of course, they went with God. It said that uh, one third of the angels were, were swept from heaven. That he deceived one third of the angels. <coughs> Satan said, and what Satan is saying here, he's saying, <coughs> That he has a better way. He said he has a better system. He's telling God, I got a better system than you, God. And Satan is system is a, is a system of, of for self, for uh, selfishness. Freedom, no rules. Freedom, no rules. Thank you, right? Deceit. And what is God? What is, what is what is his system? His system is a system of love and perfection. But Satan, he, 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 there was something in him. It's, it's, it's called the mystery of iniquity. We don't really understand what goes on. And, and, and this free choice that we have, we don't understand. And, and I don't pretend to understand, even myself at times. I, and God is teaching me to, uh, to rely on Him and not rely on myself. To have no confidence in myself. Because I know what's in a person because I can see inside of myself. And if you're honest at heart, you'll hear what I'm saying. You have to look into yourself. There's only God and you can look into yourself. Man has an ego problem, for sure. And, and, and we want to do everything ourselves. We, we, we don't want to turn our we don't want to turn things over to God. We want to hold on to them. You know, the human mind thinks that it has the, the answer to the sin problem. And like I said, the world's been around for 6,000 years and there's still, there's no pockets of perfection anywhere. I mean, look at our world today. We are, we're going nowhere fast. I mean, look at the news. It's not good. It's not pretty. God is asking us to allow Him to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. The only way we're going to, to have that perfection is uh, to allow Him to, to, to indwell us. That's the only perfection we're going to have on this side of glory until the glorification of our bodies. Thank you, Kyla. Do I sound that hoarse? <laughs>
So God is allowing Satan to prove his system now. And he could have stopped it before it even got started because God is omniscient. He knows everything. I mean, he, what does the scripture say? He even knows the hairs on the top of our head. So the only way he can allow this, uh, for the universe to see that a self-seeking government or a self-seeking person or we, we can't make it. We, we're, we, 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 we're going to fall. We're, we can't live without God is what he's trying is what God is trying to teach us. Let's go to our uh, opening text. It's Romans chapter 1. God is trying to show us that living for self, it might sound good. And it, and it even looks good at first when, I mean, when everything's, you know, right at first, everything seems great. And, but and as time goes on, things start to uh, deteriorate. If we look at how our country was founded, it was founded on godly principles. And as time goes on, this ungodliness that we, we've asked God to step away. We've asked God to step out of our schools. We've asked God to step out of our government. We've asked God to, to, to step out of our homes. I mean, we are we are fastly becoming a, a, a nation that, that is uh, not a Christian nation anymore. We are, are godless. The problem begins with godlessness. And I, and I want to show you that in uh, Romans chapter 1. And, and, and what blew me away, I was telling my buddy Ray, that I, I came across something that I'd never seen before in, in the scriptures. And it was pointed out to me through this, by this Bible teacher I like to listen to. And I'm going to try, and, and believe me, and you need to study these things for yourself. You can come to Sabbath school and, and, to, uh, and to the sermon every week and, and go away with the information we give you, but you're, you're not going to grow from it. The only way you're going to grow is you, you take these things that John talks about, that Ray talks about, that I talk about, that we talk about in Sabbath school, and you, and you study these for yourself. This is, this is the bread of life. We have to consume that. We have to consume this. And if we're not consuming it, we, we, we eat uh, meals every day to, 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 to satisfy us physically. But spiritually, what are you eating for yourself every day? You, you have to feed yourself spiritually or, or you're dead. You're going to die spiritually. And, and you're going to be what we're going to talk about. And, 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 I'm, and these, are not, these are not my words that I'm going to read. These are, these are from the Word of God. And, and I have to be careful because I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm one of you. I have, to, I have to listen to my own person. Believe me, I can be pretty convicting to myself. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, I like that, invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God is telling us, you don't have an excuse. There is no excuse for your sin. There is no excuse for you turning your back on me because... I love you so much. He, the only way you're going to be lost is you have to beat the Holy Spirit off. The Holy Spirit is, I've heard it, I, I don't like to use this name, but I, I do it because I've heard it. 
He's a hound of heaven. He is chasing after you. He is constantly knocking on the door of your heart. He says, I knock on the door of your heart. He says, if you will open it up, I will come into you. But God will not break that door down. God is a God of wrath, yes, but we're going to understand before we leave today, and it's going to be, I'm going to make it quick, that, that God has, has, His wrath is not Him beating the door down. It is not human wrath. Human wrath, we lash out. We, we lash out in anger. God's wrath, and we're, we're going to read about that. I'm going to, we're going to talk about that now. Because though they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful, but be, became futile in their thoughts, and their few foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to wise, they became fools and changed the glory of incorruptible God into the image like corruptible, corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the, for the lie and worshiped and served the creature, Satan, rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. You have a choice. You can worship God or you can worship Satan. Romans 6.16 is, is in our bulletin. It's uh, over to the left. It says, Do you not know to whom you present yourself slaves to obey? You are that one slave whom you obey, whether sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. There is no third choice. You're in, you're in one group or the other, whether you want to be or not. You're, you're, no decision is a decision. It's like, it's like, I say, you heard me say it, it's like sitting on the train track, the train is coming, no decision is a decision. I had a friend that used to say this and it used to disturb me because I, I, I had trouble believing it and I believe it now. But he says, we don't have a choice whether we do right or wrong, but we have a choice in who we're going to serve. If you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ, He indwells you and you do right. If you do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ, well, Romans chapter 1 tells us, For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. Now, i got a story. What do I do with that story? I hope I'll put it in my pocket. <laughs> just lost the head. It's just a short story. No, I, I remember what I did with it. Now, I, I decided not to fold it up. I got this from a, a pastor that I like to listen to. And I have to paraphrase it because I, if I wrote it all out, it would just take up you know, more than just this one little sheet of paper. <laughs> but it makes a good point. And, and that's why I'm here. I want to make a good point. And I want you to, uh, I, I want you to, uh, To lose confidence in what you can do for yourself. Because what we can do for ourselves is not going to get us anywhere. It's going to get, we become, when we have confidence in ourselves, and that's what Satan wants us to have confidence in ourselves, because we become legalistic. We become unloving. And a legalistic church is no, no fun at all. And, and some of you in here can attest to legalistic churches you've been in them. Anyway, the way this is the this is the point I want to make that, that I have that, that that came to me. It's like whoa! It was like it hit me. There was a, a group of people uh, that put out a petition, and they wanted to stop gay marriage. Yeah, I said gay marriage. They wanted to stop it. And I said, well, I have a problem with that. And the pastor, he says, <laughs> this is this pastor I like listening. He's got a good sense of humor. He says, what's wrong with gay marriage? And the, and the, and the ladies he was talking to said, well, it, the Bible teaches against it. And the pastor says, well, where are at? 
And they said, oh, somewhere I think in Romans. And, and the pastor, he knew what they were thinking. He said, yes, in Romans chapter 1. And what we just read, Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. I don't want you to miss this. God is saying, if you turn your back on me, this is the problem. The result will be this gay marriage. Do you get it? It's not. God, God is, God's wrath is not against people that are gay. People are gay because they have turned their backs on God and He's turned them over to themselves. Gary. Like I said, we were reading about this and I just want to make a little comment. Uh, God's wrath, we have such hard hearts. We have such self-interest. Amen. We have think our choice, God's wrath is allowing us to make the choice. We can choose Him, we can't choose Him. And if we don't choose Him, we suffer the consequences of those choices. And hopefully, as they go, we wake up and say, hey, I've made a lifetime of wrong choices. You know, He Amen. doesn't come and step in and punish us as, as human wrath, as, as we think of wrath with our, our human nature. He just lets us go do what we're going to do and the consequences show eventually. Well, he pulls away from us. Yes. Uh, if we look at 1 John 1, 5, it says, this is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. God is light. I want you to remember that. There's no darkness at all. Let's go to uh, Matthew 27, 45. And this is... Uh, the greatest demonstration of God's wrath that I, that I found in Scripture. We go to uh, Romans. I'm sorry. Thank you. Matthew chapter 27, verse 45. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour there was no there was darkness over all the land. We're talking three hours time. Jesus is hanging on the cross. God's wrath is poured out on the sin. Our sin is on Christ. God's wrath is poured out. It's darkness. God's wrath was poured out because God had pulled himself away from the earth. There was no eclipse of the sun. Have y'all ever heard of a three-hour eclipse of the sun? No way. God's wrath was poured out on, on our sin bearer. God stepped away from His Son. And look what God, and look what Jesus said. He says, I'm not going to use, read that. <laughs> Eli, Eli, Lama. I said it anyway. So back to God. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His wrath was on him because he had never been separated from his father. People look at the, the passion of Christ and they see the crucifixion. He gets beat. He gets beat and there's blood all over him. That is not the problem of the cross. That is not the gross part of the cross. Sure, it's gross, but that is not the worst problem of the cross. The worst problem of the cross, nobody can see the broken heart of Jesus Christ. He's not broken because he's all scarred. He could, he's got, he's got, he's, I mean, sure, it hurts. But this is a relief compared to the pain he's really going through. He's separated from God who had, he had been with since eternity. Jesus, if you can't hear me, you've you got to hear this. Because God loved you enough, Jesus loved you enough to do this, to go through this pain. It wasn't the physical pain that was the horrible thing. It was horrible, don't get me wrong. It was this broken heart. It, it is said that Jesus died from a broken heart because he was separated from his father. Nobody dies within the time limit on the cross that Jesus died. It was, it was unheard of. 
But like, like Ray says, Jesus gave his life. We didn't take his life. Jesus died in a broken heart. So the, it, it's, it's said that the, the full strength of God's wrath was poured out on Jesus. Jesus was, and I, 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 and I know I've already said that, I just want to reiterate that because I don't want you to forget it. Jesus' pain was not so obvious as the movies they portray with him being beaten. Although it's horrible, it's horrible for anybody to be beaten. God is asking us, He's asking you and me, He's knocking on the door of your heart. The only reason I know that is because the Scripture tells me. He's knocking on every one of your hearts. He wants to restore you to the image that He created Adam in before Adam sinned. He, he is looking to restore us. There is, uh, this, this uh, verse is talked about a lot around here even. And, I, and I want to, I'm, there's two verses I want to bring up, and I want to show you something, and then I'm going to close. I'm going to have Ray come up and close us in prayer. But um, let's go to Hebrews 10, 26. This verse right here, and it used to scare the daylights out of me. Actually, let's go to uh, John 3, 6, 3, 18 first. Everybody knows uh, John 3, 16. And I have two favorite verses in all of Scripture, and John 3.16 is one of them. Let's just start from verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And God did His part in all this. He gave His Son to us. There's two phases of justification. And that was God's part. He says, here's my Son. Our part is that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We have a part Amen. to believe. Amen. And when we believe, the Holy Spirit shows up. Amen. Because Jesus Amen. promised Him. And that's where we get our power and our strength to live the Christian life, to, to, to live the way God intended us to live. Not in our own strength. Because when you live in your own strength, you're going to fall flat on your face. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And this is really important. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in believe is condemned already because he has not believed in this name of the only begotten Son of God. So the problem here is belief and unbelief. And this is all through Scripture. And we have to take Scripture... And it has to uh, be consistent. And I want to I want to show you something to, to bring you relief. Some of you who have asked this question before. Let's go. And this is the question from uh, Hebrews chapter ten, verse twenty six. And when you read verses like this, you need to think about the other verses in Scripture. Uh, the verse just before that is, is very important also. It says, and, and I think this is, this is really a very important verse. It says, And let us not consider one another in order to stir up <clears throat> love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. It says we need to assemble. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That's coming to church. That's Bible studies. That's not just Sabbath day stuff. That's everyday stuff. We have got to come together. We've got to be unified. And I'm as guilty as, 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 as anybody sitting in here for not getting together with my brothers and sisters as my friends during the week. I, I, I should visit more. And I should get visitors more. And we should all feel that way about each other. Right now, things are really nice and smooth going. 
But when times get hard, we're going to need to lean on each other more.